Blade Runner is a story of our humanity and our inhumanity. In the future, the Tyrell Corporation has created replicants, bioengineered artificial life forms. They are illegal on Earth, and should they appear, police officers called Blade Runners track them down, interrogate them through a replicant detector called a Voight Kampf test, and execute them without trials. At the onset of the film, a group of replicants have made it to Earth in search of the head of the Tyrell Corporation in order to extend their four-year lifespan. Deckard, a retired Blade Runner, is called back into action to track them down. This is a film that pokes at our class structure and institutionalized segregation. Tyrell lives in his tower, on par with the sun, whereas people below live in a kind of neon wasteland. Dirigibles declare that people should abandon Earth and live in the off-world colonies, though they try to put a friendlier face on it. The billboards are oppressive, even watchful. Keep in mind that this isn't only a society that may be oppressive to human beings, but also a society that creates artificial intelligent life forms and makes them, as one of them describes it, slaves. The eye is the film's most frequent motif. We see close-ups of the eye at the start of the film, during Rachel's Voight Kampf test, as Roy and Leon investigate someone who genetically designs eyes for replicants, Roy murders Tyrell by pushing in his eyes, and so on and so forth. There are many other examples, and the semiotics of the film become more and more noticeable as it progresses. The eye in the beginning of the film is never explicitly shown to be that of any one particular character. We don't see the eye and then it slowly zooms out and find that it's Deckard, or Leon, or Roy, or any other character. The scene just changes to the interrogation, and that's it. If the eye in the beginning does not belong to any individual character, then the eye may well be an all-seeing eye, that of God, or time, or nature, or the universe. The eyes of replicants have a reflective orange glow. This is displayed so prominently that one wonders why anyone would need a Voight-Kampf test to reveal who is and who is not a replicant. One would guess that it should be plainly obvious just by looking into their eyes, but bear in mind that this glow, this luminescence, may not actually be literal. It may not actually be in-universe, so to speak, not in the diegesis of the film. It may be something that only we see, something the audience sees, but if so, why? A common misquote of the Gospels is, eyes are the windows to the soul, but that line is not actually in the Bible. It's more of a reference to a more elaborate quote from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. The line is a little closer to, Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, your whole body also is full of light. But when they are unhealthy, your body also is full of darkness. That being said, one can certainly interpret that quote to mean that the eyes and the soul have a connection thus forming that more famous quote as just another one of the thousands of translations of scripture. In short, in this inhuman glow of the replicants, we are actually witnessing a revelation. Replicants have souls. That is the enduring question of the film, and the reason why we so frequently see eyes as a motif. Now when I say soul, in spite of all the biblical imagery I'm referencing here, you need not take that literally. When speaking of the soul, we don't always explicitly mean a supernatural energy force that is tangibly connected to our physical body, an immortal and very real spirit that will one day receive an eternal reward in heaven. No, when speaking of the soul, we sometimes simply mean identity, personhood, a meaningfulness to our lives, and a meaning that we can select for ourselves. Soul doesn't always mean soul in the same way that heart does not always refer to the physical organ, but actually a figurative stand-in for the totality of our emotions. I'm not saying humanoid replicants, or owl replicants, or even human beings have a supernatural spirit. Only realness. Does a replicant have a soul? By that I mean, is a replicant a person? Replicants are not made of metal like most science fiction automatons. Not that that would instantly discount them as being people either, but my point is that a replicant is actually created by genetic designers. This is brought up several times in the film. Their body parts are artificial in the sense that they aren't born through sexual reproduction, but they are body parts, so to speak. Something created naturally does not give it greater worth than something created artificially. Processed food has artificial elements, but we never say that it is not food. 
a sheep that is cloned is never said to be not a sheep. Children born through in vitro fertilization are never called not human. The very idea would be offensive. What determines sapience is the ability for an animal to act with judgment. We consider human beings sapient for that reason. Replicants clearly can act with as much judgment and wisdom as humans. This is outright said in the film. Their sapience is rather obvious. A replicant says, I think, therefore I am. An English translation of the 17th century works of French philosopher René Descartes. In Latin, cogito ergo sum. It sounds quite plain, and it is. But in these three Latin words, our existence, if nothing else, is proven. We can doubt everything else in the universe, but we can't doubt that some universe exists if we can hear ourselves think. And we can't doubt our capacity for wisdom and for judgment if we can think. Replicants think. One could argue that their wiring only mimics thinking, but the same can be said of ourselves. At the very least, we can assert that replicants think as well as we do. The opening crawl confirms that they are at least as intelligent as those who create them. You know that Voight Comte test of yours? Did you ever take that test yourself? Audiences of Blade Runner, for over 30 years, debate the nature of Deckard's existence. Is he a human being or a replicant? I admit that this question intrigued me when I was younger and even when I began this show, but four years and over 150 episodes later, I see it differently. The real question is not, is Deckard a replicant? The real question is, should it matter? If Deckard is a replicant, should we empathize with him less or as much as a human Deckard? If we admit that we care about this living being with feelings and mortality less if he were born differently than ourselves, we may have failed Blade Runner's challenge. If we were to take the Voight-Kampf test and told Deckard is a replicant, and have a negative emotional response to that, would the Voight-Kampf test then judge us as less than human if we have no empathy for Deckard anymore? Blade Runner certainly makes the same determination as Descartes. When Rachel's past is called into question, Deckard says that it's all false, suggesting she is not real. But later, when he rifles through photos, we get the impression that maybe we are all just products of our memories, and whether or not they actually happened in the tangible world, the end result is still ourself, our personality, our soul. 17th century English philosopher John Locke in his Essay Concerning Human Understanding, posited that personal identity comprises nothing but our memories. Blade Runner further emphasizes a replicant's realness, a replicant's soul, with the climactic Tears in Rain speech. Roy speaks of his memories being lost in time, and when he dies at the end, he lets go of a dove, a divine symbol. We are figuratively seeing his soul leave his body, proof that he was a person, Speaking of which, let's focus our attention to a single replicant, Roy Batty. Listen to what he says in this scene. Fiery the angels fell. Deep thunder rolled around their shores, burning with the fires of Hawk. Roy's quote is actually a purposeful misquote of America, a Prophecy by William Blake. I could spend the entirety of this episode trying to describe who Blake was, but to summarize, he was a writer, artist, and one of the forerunners of modern anarchism. He rebelled against all in power, from the church to the government. His poetry consistently contained an air of rebellion and against power abuses. Some believed him to be quite mad in his time. At any rate, Roy's misquote from America should actually be fiery the angels rose and as they rose deep thunder rolled around their shores indignant burning with the fires of orc. Bear in mind that orc in this context is not of Tolkien but of Blake's own complicated mythology. He is a rebellious figure much like Roy himself. Roy likens himself to this figure orc as someone who rebels against God. In Blake's mythology, the supreme being is called Urizen. In William Blake's mythos, Orc is actually crucified, separating his Luciferian connection and attaching to a more positive figure. In Blade Runner, Roy crucifies himself, in a matter of speaking, piercing his own hand with a nail, a clear reference to the Gospels, but again, also to Orc. 
It is said that Rutger Hauer himself suggested this connection, and actually pushed for the William Blake quote in the film, perhaps having an even greater insight into the character than the screenwriter. If Orc's nemesis is Urizen, the Supreme Being, what does that say about this film? Well, even if we completely cast the Blake connection aside, since it was a very late addition to the script, the film has noticeable themes of the mortal relationship with our creators, both God and parents, the latter being a stand-in for the former. Roy's objective is to find Tyrell, the genius CEO of the corporation that builds replicants. Roy wants more life, and feels as though he has been cursed by his creator to be mortal. This is actually a common starting point when explaining man's relationship with God, anger at our mortality. Roy has it worse than most, though, as he and other replicants were given a purposeful four-year lifespan that can't be altered. This is a form of control. Roy's rebellion against God and his angelic references recalls Paradise Lost by John Milton. Displeasure with our creators is not only confined to this part of the plot. Leon, during his Voight-Kampf test, is asked about his mother. This is his reaction. Let me tell you about my mother. The audio from this encounter is replayed twice more over the course of the film, emphasizing its importance. Rachel's implanted memory of baby spiders eating their parent is another reference to this, not to mention foreshadowing the death of Tyrell. The struggle of our mortality is present throughout Blade Runner. Roy saves Deckard, finally understanding the importance of life. The Voight-Kampf test, designed to prove replicants have no empathy, is disproved due to Roy's redemptive actions. And yet, there is a kind of hopelessness to Blade Runner. Tyrell's death will not change the oligarchical power structure in their world. Replicants are still slaves. The oppressive rain hammers down on those who live below, creating this fatalism, this ennui. In the end, Deckard finds an origami unicorn left there by another detective named Gaff. Through the events of the film, Gaff has mocked Deckard with his origami, first insisting he is a coward, a chicken, then suggesting Deckard is thinking with his hormones, a man with an erection, and then showing him the unicorn, a vision from Deckard's dreams that Gaff somehow knows about. Deckard and Rachel leave to escape, but there is no salvation. Rachel will only live for a few years, and for the rest of Deckard's life, he will be hunted. Gaff is letting him know this. This is his message. The fate of Rachel is the fate of us all. Our existence is a blessing, but our mortality, a curse. We're all going to the same place. If Deckard thinks he's getting a happy ending, he's dreaming. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Ten Houser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears. 